But uh, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us um, and welcome to the Introduction to Risk Management Workshop. Um, this is part of our integral intro series where we generally prevent, uh, present uh, overviews of the areas of expertise that Integral provides. Um, that includes nonprofit governance, legal compliance, and of course, risk management. Um, so yeah, I know many of you have signed up for multiples of this intro series, and we hope you're enjoying it. Um, if you don't already know, my name is Liz Tang. I use the pronoun she, her, and I'm the program coordinator for Integral Org, and I'll be around hosting, monitoring the chat, um, and any sort of technology support that you might need. So without further ado, we'll hop right into um, our land acknowledgement. So it's important to acknowledge that what we call Alberta is the traditional and ancestral territory of many peoples, but presently subject to treaties 6, 7, and 8, namely the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Gaina, the Pagani, Siksika, the Cree, Dene, Soto, Nakota Sioux, Stony Nakota, and the Sutina Nation, and the Métis people of Alberta. This includes the Métis settlements in the six regions of the Métis Nation of Alberta within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. Um, we do respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations. And we are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. And we make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside and work on today. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce today's facilitator. This is Leslie Tamagi, who has more than 25 years experience as CEO of diverse organizations and understands firsthand the complex challenges facing management, staff and boards in the nonprofit sector. In 2007, she spent a year as a Mutart Foundation Fellow studying risk management in the sector, and she's been providing training to nonprofit organizations for over a decade, um, supporting them through their risk management journeys. So again, I'll be around. Um, you can message me on this chat, and thank you all for joining us. Great. Thank you so much, Liz. Really appreciate everyone coming today. Uh, today is one of those days I'm thankful for the capacity of online learning. <laughs> so nice to not have to as one of those people who haven't got their snow tires on, um, the irony of someone who does risk management who hasn't got it together in her personal life always. But anyways, uh, hopefully everyone got to where they needed to get to safely today. So we're going to spend some time today talking about the, just the fundamentals of risk management and an overall framework for how to approach it. Um, we'll spend some time on the top risks facing organizations now and in the near future. Uh, we'll touch on the role of the board. That's always a bit of an interesting topic for those of us who are in leadership positions um, and your risk management journey. And hopefully you'll come away with some tools and some resources. I mean, this is just a teaser, really. We do uh, quite a bit more extensive risk management training through Integral Org. But my goal in this is to make the whole thing less overwhelming. You are the experts in your own work. Um, you don't need to hire a very, very expensive, you know, consultant to come in and write your risk management plan. Hopefully, you know, today you'll have an appreciation of, you know, this is what you do every single day. Um, and you have, you have the skills and the knowledge. Capacity is always an issue for all of us in, in the nonprofit sector, but, but you really are your own experts. Um, and so I want to make this as kind of less overwhelming and as accessible to everybody and, and give you some um, tips and tools to get you on your way. Um, just wanted to start with, and we'll do this in the chat function, you know, who's here. Um, it's always nice just to have a sense of who, who's joining us today. So in the chat, if you could put your name, um, the organization you're with, your title, if you want. Um, and also, what do you think is the biggest risk your organization is currently facing? And Liz is going to monitor the chat for me, and then we're going to come back to the risks that you're, you know, that you're currently facing and, and uh, spend a little bit more time on those so yeah, as we're talking in the next few minutes, if you could put your name, your organization and your biggest risk in the chat, that would be much appreciated. And feel free to say hi to each other. I'm sure there's some folks on here who know each other. So I just wanted to start off by, you know, acknowledging that um, I think risk has been made into this, you know, special thing that's separate from everything we do. And my belief is risk management is just inherent in everything that we do. Um, you know, life is full of surprises, positive and negative, and, you know, we can only avoid them if we avoid life. Um, so, you know, people talk about being proactive and 
But the reality is life is already in motion. And, you know, we can prepare for some things. We can prepare for some uncertainties. But sometimes we just have to roll with what comes. Um, so all of our choices are fraught with peril. But, you know, inaction is the most perilous of all. And you know, sometimes people say that nonprofits are risk aversive. I actually say that risk, nonprofits take on more risk than any other type of organization because of the work that we do. Um, and so our job is to embrace risk, is to, um, you know, be aware of it, to integrate it, risk management into everything we do, you know, but if we, if we try to avoid all risk, we'll never be able to provide services to the folks that we're trying to serve or do the work that we're trying to work. So we can't advance without taking risk. But what is risk? And, and just very simply, I think it's good to start with some common language. Risk is just the possibility of good or bad things happening. So it's it's about these elements of uh, uncertainty. So risk isn't a given. It's it's when things are uncertain. And I think we're all feeling right now that we live in a pretty uncertain world. It's also about looking forward. And it's very easy to look in our rear view mirrors and look behind us, but we want to be looking through our front windshield and looking at what's coming at us. And most importantly, risk has typically been seen as, you know, managing bad things, but also it's about opportunities and good things. And so we need to kind of balance that, that negative perception of risk with how do we take advantage of the wonderful opportunities that can really drive our organizations forward. And the thing is, risk is there whether you manage it or not. So let's choose to go in with our eyes wide open and do the best that we can to manage it or prepare for it. So risk management then is just a discipline for dealing with uncertainty. So it's having you know some plans in place that we try to figure out what the most prevalent risks are that might be facing our organization. How can we assess them and how do we want to prepare for or respond to them? And again, looking at both potential losses and potential gains. So the goal is to understand risk so we can make informed choices. So on the downside, obviously you wanna reduce the probability and magnitude of bad things happening, right? And also stimulating the recovery from losses. Because if we are prepared for losses, we might be able to get back on our feet much more quickly. But on the upside, we wanna increase the probability and magnitude of good things happening. And so searching out and acting on opportunities to more fully, more certainly, more effectively achieve our goals for our organizations. So again, always keeping in that good and bad part because it's really important. But when we think about risk like this, it's not some plan that sits on the shelf. It's just our day-to-day, -day, how we approach things, how we do business, which means it's not you know, some other person's job or some department. It's everybody's job in the organization. So risk management really is just about running a nonprofit as best you can so that you can fulfill your mission in uncertain future. Right? So again, it's just, it just has to be integrated into everything we do, our decisions, our day-to-day -day operations, um, all the way through the organization. So I was just going to do a quick poll. And again, you can just respond in the chat function. Is how prepared are you? Is your organization for the emerging risks in 2023 and beyond? So you're feeling like you're pretty well got it together. You have a comprehensive risk management plan. You know, you're really working on building resilience. If so, you're a one. Or are you a two? You spent some time preparing for it, but you still think there's some gaps. Or are you a three? You're just starting and you feel like you have a long ways to go. Or are you a four? You're just trying to survive. And honestly, do not feel bad if you're feeling like you are a three or a four, because this is very common in our sector. A study done before the pandemic started showed that only 50% of organizations had um, emergency and continuity plans in place. And if, you know, if you're from Calgary, you know that we have, go through multiple disasters that have impacted our work. Um, but it, it's really a challenge for us to have the capacity to get plans in place. So don't feel bad if you're not alone. I am the queen of just-in-time risk management. I started at an agency as an interim executive director a month before the pandemic hit. 
we had nothing in place. I wrote the policy on working from home the day we got sent home. So don't feel bad about it. Sometimes, you know, when the fire goes off, you just have to attend to the biggest crisis at the time. But as long as just on an ongoing basis, you're trying to address things, that's how you're going to progress. But if we sit and wait until we have a lot of time and then we're really going to dig into this stuff, we may never get to it. So I'm just, I love the theory. We just pick away, pick away, pick away at it. So Liz, what are the results show? Where are people at? Um, definitely a pretty solid split between twos and threes. We see a yeah. few um, folks between a three and a four as well. So yeah. Yeah, that's, and that's again, really typical and nothing to feel bad about. The whole thing is, you know, it's a journey. It's not a destination, right? And so every step forward is progress. I'm just going to show you a quick video. Um, it's out of the States, but it does talk about why risk management is so important. So some of the language will be a little bit different, but I think the concepts are there. Okay. Sound good. Why is yep. nonprofit risk management important? Why would you or any other nonprofit leader spend any time or money on nonprofit risk management? Well, to put it simply, the business model of a nonprofit is very challenging. To understand, imagine this story. A friend of yours comes to you with a business proposition. She says that she wants you to invest your retirement money in her new business. It's going to have a couple of unusual characteristics. In order to perform some of its basic services, the business will rely on volunteers who can't be fired or disciplined. The business will be criticized if it ever consistently makes more money than it spends in a given year. In fact, no matter how effective the operations may be, many people will judge the business based on how much overhead it has. In other words, how much money it invests in its people and other assets. The business will have no access to capital markets. It can't sell stock. Instead, it will have to rely on government grants and the kindness of strangers to provide donations to make ends meet. If it sells products or services, it will sell those at below market rates. The business will also hire at below market rates and put its employees in challenging circumstances where they deal with customers who may be under substantial stress or hardship. Not one of you would invest your retirement savings in this kind of a business, but I've just described the average 501c3 in the United States. Risk management is important for any organization, but it's absolutely critical for a business running on the nonprofit model. You want to be there for your beneficiaries when they need you. Because of the risks you face, risk management is not just a good idea. It's essential to your nonprofit's resilience and sustainability. So I think he brings out some interesting concepts. Um, I don't agree with absolutely everything he said. I think you can fire volunteers, for example. But, you know, this idea is that nonprofits work under very unique circumstances. We work with some of the most challenging individuals trying to tackle these major world problems. And, you know, we do things that sometimes for-profits wouldn't touch because they're too risky. Um, and yet we have this reputation of nonprofits being risk averse. I don't think we are at all. I just think we need to embrace risk as part of our way of fulfilling the mission of our organizations. So why do risk management? What are some of the benefits? Um, and first and foremost, I think it's about focusing on your mission because doing risk management will help remove barriers to achieving your mission, but also help you identify opportunities to further your mission. Um, of course, we have the responsibility to protect the individuals that we're there to serve, our staff, our volunteers. So we have some, some very high obligations. Um, it's also about protecting, of course, your public image and your reputation if that's damaged can be very, very difficult to recover from. Um, I think risk management helps us in our planning and our preparation and helps save resources and also focus our resources. So we certainly don't want to suffer, suffer a loss, but if we're able to recover more quickly, get back into business, that, that benefits our mission. Um, certainly reducing the likelihood of legal action, and, and uh, I'm not a fan of, of risk management being, being driven by the fear of uh, legal action, because, you know, if someone wants to sue you, they'll sue you. But if anyone has ever been through legal action, you know, it's just, it's incredibly 
energy sucking. And really the only people who benefit typically are the lawyers at the end of the day. I think you probably have um, encountered if you've renewed your insurance lately that your insurers are asking a lot more information about your risk management practices. They're wanting to see evidence that you have you know, got considerations and policies and things like that in place. And then also accreditation standards are starting to look at the area of risk management. But more importantly, I think it's about, it's the right thing to do. If you really want to improve your services, um, use your limited resources effectively and fulfill your mission, then it's up to all of us to focus on risk management. So here's a little framework I think that can help us think through, because again, it can be pretty overwhelming. You know, where do you start? Like, where do you, how do you get going? Or how do you know if you're doing okay? And I separate this to the left-hand side as the framework. That's kind of your plan to plan. How are you going to approach risk management within your organization? And then on the right-hand side is the process. So on the left-hand side of the framework um, is things like, you know, what are you trying to accomplish through risk management? What's your purpose of being engaged? Because that will determine if, you know, what, maybe how you structure it. If you don't know what your outcomes are, then how do you know if you're successful? Who's going to be involved? How are you going to engage people across the organization? Um, you know, do you have a risk management policy? Do you have a framework? Those kinds of things. And then how are you going to know if you're getting, getting anywhere? How are you going to measure your progress? And then the actual process of risk management is actually quite simple. You need to identify risks. You need to do some kind of analysis of risk. And you need to put some kind of responses in place. And then you need to continually evaluate their effectiveness. So it's just this constant planning cycle. But just going back to the framework a, a little bit, some things to think about when you're looking at your own risk management journey. This said, starting with the context about what you're trying to accomplish. I spoke with an individual who um, worked with a large service provider, and, and he said that when they started their risk management journey a number of years ago, it was really driven by a fear of legal consequences. So it was kind of a CYA approach, and they ended up with policy, policy, policy manuals, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of, you know, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Um, and then he said it was just completely ineffective because stuff just got bogged down. They didn't read it. And it really wasn't accomplishing what they had hoped. So they threw all that out and they said, what we really wanted to accomplish in risk management is we want to provide outstanding quality of service while still you know, fulfilling our obligations to work with the vulnerable youth that we serve. And instead of writing a whole bunch of rule books, they wrote what they call playbooks. So instead of telling their staff, don't do this, don't do this, they help staff think through scenarios. You're out with a small group of people in you know, out, out in the forest somewhere on an overnight camping trip, and this happens, what are we going to do about it? And they train their staff to think through scenarios instead of spending their time having staff read policies. And he said it made a completely different, uh, it was a completely transformative shift in their organization. So figuring out why you want to do this is a really good place to start. Um, it's always good to have a policy, but then think about, you know, who needs to be involved? Um, and it's really important to have some boots on the ground in this so that you have a really good idea of what's actually really happening out there. Sometimes if we're sitting back as leaders, we think we know what's happening, but it may not actually be how it's uh, coming out in real life. And then also about the culture, and I'll talk a little bit more about the culture because this is a really critical element. But this constant process of kind of your plan to plan and then figuring out how it's working and making adjustments. And then the actual process, as I mentioned, is actually fairly simple. It's just identifying, analyze, analyzing, and then figuring out your responses. So we're going to spend a little bit of time going through this in more detail. So how do you identify risks? And again, this can get pretty overwhelming when you start making lists of all the potential risks for your organization and you, you know, in, end up with 865 things that you're supposed to be dealing with, and it gets completely overwhelming. It can be helpful if you think about categories. So these are categories of risk that um, are part of a toolkit that Integral Org has developed that um, we'll talk about in just a minute here. But if it, you, can't, um, you, you can't manage risks if you haven't identified them. So it is important to spend some time figuring out what are the risks that you need to be paying attention to. So these buckets can help us think through some of the potential risks. 
Of course, the challenges risks tend to be a bit more complicated. They don't necessarily stay in one lane. So if you have, for example, a donor that gets disgruntled, you might have a reputational risk and then they might pull funding. So then that becomes a financial risk. You know, so they're not tend to be neat and tidy, but a process of looking at different buckets or categories of risk can help us think about what kind of risks we need to really be paying attention to. And if we brainstorm and talk to staff and, and you know, incorporate this on a regular basis at, say, staff meetings where people are starting to think about risks, then this can help us really figure out where do we focus our energies. But I wanted to just introduce you to this toolkit, which is a free toolkit from Integral Org that can help you identify risks. Hi, welcome to the Risk Management Toolkit on Integral Tools. This is our Integral Tools website. Uh, to reach the Risk Management Toolkit, you would first click Learn More. And this is our free Risk Management Toolkit. It's informed by experts both internal and external to Integral Org to cover best practices and proactive strategies within major categories of risk. Uh, it works for organizations of all sizes and at any stage of risk management, whether they are new to risk management or have foundational practices already in place. This toolkit contains a series of quizzes to assess your organization's capacity to manage risk, and it will require you to engage with people at different levels and departments in your organization to answer the quizzes accurately. You and your staff know what works best, um, and it usually just takes the right tools and resources and just some time to think it through. So don't do it alone. Um, make it part of everyone's role so no one steps over that banana peel. On this main page, you'll find a brief introduction for the toolkit with general information about risk management and what you'll need to get started and general information about Integra Org and our risk management training offerings. During this initial assessment, uh, It'll just gauge your organization's overall engagement with risk management. You can revise these answers, skip them, go back at them um, at any time as your risk management practices develop. This is a preview of your organization's risk management dashboard. Each quiz will generate an indicator to help your team monitor progress as you develop your risk management program. You'll choose a risk category to get started. Um, in this case, I will choose legal and compliance. And in each quiz, it'll give you examples of risks in that area, as you can see in this next page. So you might be asked some specific question about your practices, um, whether or not, for example, you're a registered charity in this case. So you'll click the tool tip just to learn more. And the quiz will customize you the following questions to your circumstance. Each indicator for each risk category will help you prioritize areas of vulnerability and these overall gauges for policy, compliance, and skills and competency are influenced by the answers all across all the risk categories within this toolkit. At the bottom there's customized recommendations based on your quiz results and if you click review answers to any of your past quizzes and you scroll down to the bottom you can share the results um, via web link or PDF. You can use these to prioritize next steps, build awareness, and communicate priorities for risk management within your organization. And if that wasn't enough, there's also a resource page here at the top right to help your organization continue through its risk management journey. So uh, as mentioned, this is a potentially just a really handy tool to get your st yourself started. And the most important, I think, um, and a benefit can be just the conversations. So, you know, you can share this tool with your staff, you can have them start to fill out pieces of it. It can spark all kinds of interesting discussions about where we're at as an organization and, and where do we need to be paying attention? So, or what are some of the opportunities that we're, we might be missing because we're not, uh, we're not seeing them all, so. I wanted to circle back to top risks facing nonprofits in 2023. So this list has been compiled from some research and from talking to people, um, but there's some big things that we're all facing. Uh, first ones, you know, related to COVID. Um, I think we all thought we would be done by now, but there seems to be more people with COVID in the last few weeks than we've seen for a really long time. So, you know, we're not out of COVID. Some people say we'll never actually be out of these kind of pandemics. We'll just always be either in them or in between them. Um, but they are having long-term impact. 
you know, some agencies never recovered. Um, some agencies have done amazing during COVID and had all kinds of, of opportunities that they've been able to take advantage of, and, you know, to uh, shift how they deliver services, um, taking advantage of all the financial resources available, and some organizations have really struggled. Um, so there's been some, some positives and some negatives for sure. But, you know, we're not going back to where we were before. We know that. Um, and I would say overall, just the stress level is, is just high. People are just tired. Um, so we're having to adapt on an ongoing basis of what this new, this new future looks like with all the uncertainty that goes with it. Uh, in terms of culture and human resources, again, you know, the amount of people who um, are having some mental health issues or are struggling, who are tired, you know, we have the great resignation and we also have the quitting in place thing that's happening where people are struggling and and then trying to figure out the right model for your organization between a hybrid or in person, or you can continue to be remote um, and dealing with not everybody being on the same page with that. Um, so I'm sure that's a challenge for all leaders right now, trying to figure out that. Um, cyber threats, people are saying this is the next pandemic. Um, if you don't think you've been hacked, you're not looking closely enough. So in the last four years, I've been uh, interim executive director of three organizations, all of whom have been held for ransom. And, you know, two of these organizations are teeny tiny little organizations that most of you wouldn't even know about. So it's not just the big guys that are getting hacked. It's everybody and anybody. And your biggest risk in cyber threats is your staff. And so by doing some basic training with your staff, you can really help protect your organization against cyber threats because your staff are really your key defense as well as, well as your biggest risk. Uh, revenue diversification, and again, in the pandemic, we really saw it as the organizations that rely very heavily on one source um, got hit potentially very hard. Um, so everybody's trying to figure out how to diversify our revenue sources right now. Uh, reputation and increased scrutiny and social media is brutal with this because people believe what they read. So anybody can post anything about your organization or yourself as the leader um, and people believe it to be true. And as I mentioned before, recovering from a damaged reputation can be extremely difficult. Um, whether it was, it was uh, an earned negative reputation or not. Um, insurance market, uh, again, if anyone's done renewals lately, it's harder and harder to get insurance. In fact, people are just getting turned down. I was just working with an organization trying to get abuse coverage and they were refused. So um, insurance companies are getting much more strict about when they're going to insure organizations and what needs to be in place in order for them to feel confident in insuring you. So that's creating challenges. Plus, of course, the costs are going up. I don't know if any of you are on the recent um, webinar about inflation, but the impact of inflation that we're really starting to see now in the nonprofit sector, um, the cost of everything, of course, has gone up, but funding hasn't. And so most organizations are running on funding that goes back at, at least five years at the same level. And yet our costs have gone up 10 to 15 percent minimally for the basics. So affordability of, of life is critical for the people that we serve and for our staff. And I've heard of agencies now talking about how their staff are competing with their clients for affordable housing or, you know, your staff are going to the food banks and things like that. Um, and so some agencies are really having to cut back, going back to basics. Um, and, and on top of the pandemic, it's kind of been seen as the last straw. Um, fraud uh, is, is significantly increasing. So our need to have strong financial management practices in place is rising. Um, and then third-party third risks, and as if we don't have enough to worry about ourselves, we have to worry about our third-party vendors and of course, you know, the toilet paper at the start of the pandemic was everybody's uh, prime example of what happens when you rely on other people to provide your essentials. So, you know, we need to be thinking about them as well. <clears throat> so just some things, you know, to really be on your radar. And Liz, I'm, I'm curious as when people make comments about the biggest risks they're facing, how do they, how do they resonate with these? Um, yeah, two, two large themes seem to be turnover. So we have the um, culture and HR 
bucket there on all levels. So um, board turnover, senior staff, volunteers, and um, other staff, and that sort of turnover going hand in hand with retention um, and disrupting program delivery. Um, that was the, the one of the big themes. And I, I think the other theme uh, echoes what you were saying in the inflation side is just a lack of sustainable funding with, um, yeah, rising costs and everything. Um, we have shifting government policy. Um, we have, you know, burnout, as, as you mentioned as well, and uh, organizational capacity. So, yeah. <laughs> so unfortunately, we won't get a chance to figure out how to solve all these and how we want to respond to them. Um, but no, you're not alone. And, you know, if you have a chance to connect with some of your colleagues and talk about their strategies, especially around the HR one is, is, is very prevalent right now. People really struggling with finding people and hanging on to people to do the work. Um, so you're not alone out there. So we've identified all these risks and again, can be completely overwhelming. So we need to figure out where we need to put our energies. And so some form of analysis can be very helpful in this, trying to figure out what the priorities need to be. Because otherwise we just end up with these lists and lists and lists and then we get frozen um, and don't actually do anything about any of them. So I think the most fundamental question to ask is how does this risk either impede or support our ability to fulfill our mission? And that's kind of the bottom line in terms of trying to prioritize. So if this is a mission critical, then we know we need to pay attention to it. But if it's something that not so critical, then it probably goes down in the priority list. Um, and you know, there's various tools out there to help us with this. Um, again, we don't have time to go into a lot of detail today, but I'll just show you a couple. Um, probably really the one that you've seen the most is this heat map. It's called the risk register. And to complete this, basically you have identified all your risks and then you go through and rank them in terms of likelihood, potential likelihood. So is it low, is it going to happen or is it high, it's going to happen? And then what the potential impact is going to be. So if it's very low impact and very low likelihood, then it's down in that dark green and it's probably not a priority. But if you've rated it as likely and high impact, then it's going to be in the red zone. So this is just a tool to help you figure out where do you invest your energies? What do you have to pay attention to? There's some challenges with this, though, and this is in every risk management book, I swear, every ever written. And it looks like, OK, this is going to be super helpful. But the reality is we're actually not that good about predicting either impact or likelihood. You know, you get the 100 year flood in Calgary that we weren't prepared for because we thought the likelihood was low. And it was low, but the impact was significant on many organizations. And so it can make, it can sometimes create a bit of a false sense of security that we were focusing on the right things. Also doesn't show how prepared you are. So it might be a high likelihood and it might have a high impact, but you might be really prepared. So you might not need to spend more time on it. So you'll see this tool out here, but I just wanted to mention that, you know, there are some limitations to the tool. But the tool is only good as the, gener as the conversation it generates, right? And so if this tool generates good conversation with your teams about where do we need to focus our energies, then by all means, it's an appropriate tool to use. Um, just another approach I've found recently is, is, again, trying to prioritize a look at, you know, is it critical? Does it need to be addressed promptly? And gives you some criteria for maybe trying to prioritize all your risks. So if there's potential of legal liability, health and safety, or, or it's, you know, unethical, then it's got to be up there in the critical, and that's where you're going to start, start your energies, okay? So again, the value is in the conversation, though, not you just sitting in your office by yourself trying to figure this out. Um, and then once you've determined where you want to invest your energies, you have to figure out what you're going to do about it and what kind of response is going to be most effective. And I've seen organizations write very, very extensive risk management policies for flood, for, for fire, for, you know, tornado, for bomb threats. For, and, and at the end of the day, all that is about is we've lost access to our office or we've lost access to a portion of our workforce, 
or we've lost access to the internet. I would suggest instead of focusing on what the source of the problem is, you focus on what the impact is and deal with the impact because you don't really need 18 different policies on the fact that you can't get into your office or you've lost your workforce. You need to focus your energies on what are we going to do if we don't have access to all of our workforce? And the cause isn't as important. So if you look at impact versus source, it can help cut down some of the work that you need to do. But in figuring out a response, there's again, there's a number of options available, and this can just help you think through some of those. So um, one response is try to reduce the likelihood or the occurrence. So, so to, to mitigate, in this case, a negative risk. So these are the ones where you know you can put policies and procedures in place to help mitigate your risks. So you know, having two signing authorities on any kind of financial transactions or you know having staff training in place, having first aid kits, have you know all those kinds of things. You're trying to reduce um, the impact or likelihood after it's happened, right? You can also try to transfer the risk. So we often do this by um, maybe having people sign waivers or having insurance or outsourcing certain kinds of work. But knowing that you never totally transfer your risk, you know, if someone slips and falls in your organization because the floor was wet and you subcontract that janitorial service, you're still going to get named in that lawsuit. So you can't completely transfer risk. So it's important to remember that um, when you're going through this. Um, and, you know, often we think we're insured for things, and then sometimes we find out the hard way that that insurance didn't really cover us. Um, you know, business interruption insurance didn't cover anybody during the pandemic that I've talked to. So, you know, sometimes we have to really read the fine print to figure out what it is that we are actually transferring in terms of, um, of the risk. Um, some risks we just accept. We say we're prepared to accept it. It's at a rate, uh, it's at a level that, it's not worth further investment. So we're just prepared to accept it. Sometimes we have to avoid it completely. So we stop the activity and you, you know, you see things less like the, um, you know, organizations not serving alcohol anymore at any of the functions that they sponsor. They've just decided the risk is too high and they're just not going to do it. Or, you know, they divest themselves of certain programs and change the scope of their services. Um, and then the last one is about exploiting, and that's about the positive things, you know, the leveraging of the opportunities. You know, so can we look at partnerships? Can we look at mergers? Can we look at innovation? Can we look at renegotiating things? So how can we look at the positive side of these as well and really try to exploit them? But often it takes a combination of approaches, and what we think was going to work doesn't always work because humans are pretty complex and they don't always act in the way that we think they're going to act. Um, but again, thinking through these and, and having, as I said before, you know, the people who are going to be responsible for implementation, really having them involved in deciding, deciding what the response is most appropriate would be for your organization um, so that you know, the chances of being successful are much higher. And then always going back and figuring out, you know, did it work? And what do we need to do to adjust it? So that continuous cycle of of um, identifying, assessing, and responding to. I just wanted to introduce a different way of thinking about risk because this has really, I think, become more helpful in the last couple of years. Because we tend to talk about risk as if it's all one thing. And there's different kinds of risk and our approaches to them need to be different. So this is based on um, the work of Kaplan and Mike sort of the called managing risk out of the US and this framework, they talk about preventable risks. So these are largely your operational risks. These are the ones that you actually probably can manage. You know, you can mitigate, you can avoid, you can transfer, you can accept. Um, you know, this, these are things like providing training and having, you know, policies and procedures and protective equipment. These usually are things that you can manage. We tend to focus a lot of our energy on these. I think part of that is because they are things that you can manage. But then there's this whole category of external risks, and these are the things over which we have almost no control. So pandemics, floods, fires, those kinds of things. You might be able to reduce the likelihood of them happening. You certainly can prepare for them, though. 
You may not be able to prevent them, but you can prepare. And so it's important that we spend time on thinking about these. Alberta is one of the largest natural disaster centers in the world. So we know we're going to have them. So we should be thinking about how we're going to uh, be prepared for them so we can reduce the damage that occurs and recover quickly. And, you know, we can, we can train staff in emergencies. We can, you know, we can do things to help with this. And then the strategic risks are those risks that you take, you know, for, for returns to further your organization. And again, how you prefer, prepare for those is different. So if we walk through this, as I already mentioned, the preventable risks are those kind of operational things. Um, usually you can manage them to some extent or get them to an acceptable level. The strategic risks, the rules don't work, but we can do, um, you know, we can do things to prepare for them. We can do things like um, scenario planning. You know, what happens if you get a 10% funding cut, a 20% funding cut? What if you get 40% more money? What are you gonna do? You can prepare in advance. And, and the study shows that the mere act of planning for different futures prepares you better and you will respond better, even if you were way off what you thought was going to happen. <laughs> but the actual exercise of planning will, will, will hold you in good stead. So we don't have to get it perfect. And then things like uh, external, these are way beyond our control, but we can prepare and we, we can do training. So this is like simulation exercises. You know, this is your fire drills. This is responding to emergencies. And it does make a big difference. If you think back to the Fort McMurray fires, um, I don't know how many of you remember watching on TV the evacuation of Fort Mac and those endless streams of cars driving <laughs> through this huge fire to get to safety. And in the analysis that ha um, happened after that, one of the reasons that there was you know, so little human damage done, I'm not talking about emotional damage, but I don't even think there was a single casualty in that whole thing is because almost all those people had training in responding to emergency situations because of where they worked. But it had that happened in some other place, the ability for people to calmly evacuate through that kind of crisis was probably going to be quite reduced. So it's interesting, like, you don't, you never know what's going to happen until, you know, the crisis occurs, but but helping people train for it does make a difference. So I, I just found this helpful thinking through, you know, we try to write rules sometimes or things that it's never going to work. But there are tools that we can use like scenario planning or simulations that can help us prepare. I just wanted to mention for a second about what's called the black swans. So these are... Um, hard to predict occurrences that nevertheless have enormous impact on people's lives. And I think we've all can think of an example of that. Um, they're virtually unpredictable, but they can and do occur with actually quite high frequency. So these previously unimaginable events, they do happen. And so whether it's the pandemic or when we were preparing in the past for SARS or some of the other kind of global issues that have impacted us, you know, if you really look into it, um, you can prepare for some of these. And again, if you think about strategic, external, and operational, and prevental, and, and think about how can we position our organization to um, take advantage of the opportunities and min minimize any of the negative risks that happen when these, these big events happen. So what can we learn from COVID? And, and I'm sure you have spent some time on this, but, you know, it's good to spend... Um, to really reflect on, you know, did it unfold as you thought it was going to be? You know, what made it challenging? And if you'd known it was coming, what would you have done differently? I think that's a great question to spend time on with staff. Um, I've only heard of one agency who had pandemic insurance in advance, and uh, they were an arts organization, and, and because they had that in advance, they survived. Um, but, you know, most of us weren't expecting it, and certainly it didn't unfold as we thought, and we thought it would be kind of done a lot faster. Um, one of my colleagues was working with an organization doing scenario planning in June, no, January 2020. And he suggested that one of the scenarios they might be thinking about and planning for was a global pandemic. And the response from the organization was, 
No, we actually don't think that's a very realistic uh, scenario. I don't think we're going to spend any time on it. So two months later, in the middle of a global pandemic. So, um, But we can learn from COVID. And most organizations did an incredible job of responding to and adjusting their services. And, and, and you know, now it's great to spend some time thinking about what, what do we want to continue to take forward? Because um, our environment's going to continue to change very rapidly. I just wanted to touch on the role of the board. Um, this is often a, a bit of confusion around the role of the board in this, but the role the board has very distinct roles in risk management and roles that they cannot delegate completely. Um, but it's often a bit of a push pull of what they should be doing. But very basically, the board has four key roles. They have fiduciary responsibilities. These are their legal responsibilities that they can be held accountable for. And it's related um, to the duty of care and the duty of loyalty. And the board and individual board members are expected to hold certain standards and behave in certain ways and be on top of certain things. And that's legal responsibilities. They have the duty of stewardship, and that's about protecting your assets. And that's money and physical assets, but it's also your people assets. So they have a responsibility to make sure that things are in place to protect those. They also have a role in foresight. And I think this is where we may underutilize our board sometimes um, because your board brings a very diverse background to the table. They may see things that you don't see. You know, as staff, often we're head down, bum up, just trying to get our jobs done. And I liken it to, you know, the old pirate ships where, you know, the leader might be holding the wheel, trying to steer the ship and keep them straight on course. But the board should be up in the lookout tower and seeing what's coming up down the pipes. They can help feed that information to the leaders of the organization because they have a different external perspective. But sometimes it's hard when we're, when we're in the organization and we're so busy. It's hard for us to see that. And then they have an oversight function. And that's about um, you know, making sure that the organization is fulfilling its mission and, and that things are in place to support the organization and protect the organization. Um, and that cannot be completely delegated. So risk management is clearly one of the board's most important roles and they need to work in conjunction with staff. Um, but their focus should be on the higher level external and strategic risks, not spending all their time checking over the shoulder of the executive director to see, see if they have specific policies in place to to address the operational risks. Um, so we could spend a whole session on governance risk, so I won't go into more detail now, but something to think about. I mentioned culture, and I'm sure you've all heard the Peter Drucker quote that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And in risk management, I would say it eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The importance of your culture in cultivating risk management um, within your organization cannot be overemphasized because your culture will really determine how effective any of your strategies will be. So it's really important to spend some time thinking about the risk management culture of your organization, what it is and what you want it to be. When I st first started working at an organization, um, they boasted a zero incidence of accidents you know, for four years, and they were very, very proud of it. And I thought, well, I mean, that's great, but that, that sounds like really amazing, um, considering the work that they did. And what it turned out is, is not that there had no, been no incidents. There was a culture of not reporting. People were discouraged from reporting incidents. So you don't want a culture where you don't hear about stuff. You don't want a culture where people don't feel safe expressing diverse opinions. Because again, you can't manage risks if you don't know about them. And if you look at some of the real big disasters in history, like the Challenger explosion of, of the um, spacecraft, when they did a, a real investigation into that, it was clear that people had voiced multiple concerns that this was going to happen and they weren't heard. So we have to create a culture where people will come forward. You have to feel like their input will be valued or else you just, you, 
all your strategies. You can spend all your time developing strategies and it may not be effective. So how do we create this culture? Um, and the culture that is everybody's job. There's not some department over there that deals with risk management. No, it's every single person's job every day, every minute to think about risk management. That's how you're gonna get success within your organization. So be intentional about the kind of culture that you need for your organization and how you're going to create it. You know, you might have to start like I did, like really uncovering some pretty nasty stuff so that you can get to the bottom of it and start to rebuild. And when it comes to risk management, I think we're really talking about resiliency. And I know that you that word isn't really being overused these days, but we are trying to create resiliency within our organizations. We used to talk about stability. Stability is about staying the same. We can't stay the same anymore. We need to be resilient. And that's about existing over time. Uh, so being able to adjust to all the uncertainties that we're facing. So it's about thinking and learning and evolving and, and having to, you know, many ways give up some of our more stricter rules and policies and things like that because they're just not working anymore. So how do we really build resiliency using risk management? Um, again, it's about the culture, making it part of everybody's job. Um, having a board that is informed and involved and using them really around, as I said before, the strategic risks, the external ris risks and getting them out of the weeds. Um, seeing risk as a value-added activity. I think, again, it's had this kind of bad rap as a, as a thing you have to do maybe to get insurance or accreditation. Instead of seeing how do we really put our mission at the central part of everything we do and how do we move the barriers and take advantage of the opportunities so we can fulfill our mission. And cognitive diversity is about bringing different perspectives to the table and having those conversations. And the pandemic is so interesting. You know, we couldn't just listen to the economists. We couldn't just listen to the epidemiologists. You know, we couldn't just listen to the mental health experts because they are all saying different things. We had to somehow weave those together and figure out um, how we were going to manage through this. The VUCA mindset, you might have heard the term VUCA stands for volatility uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And that is the world we live in now. And even more so, it's about complexity and ambiguity. So this is kind of the basis for systems thinking. Um, and complexity is a fact in risk management. And so again, shifting our mind from we can just we can just write a rule or a policy to address that to, to how do we really dig into some of these um, and come up with responses that are gonna be effective. And risk learning, seeing it as a journey, it's it's not a destination. As I said, it's a never-ending process. It's, it's just about day after day after day, uh, trying to take a step forward and evolving and adapting. And then embracing risk. Um, I think we should be very proud of, of the risk that nonprofits take and that we need to take to fulfill our missions instead of trying to avoid risk. So I'm just going to close with this quote. If you take risks, you may fail. But if you do not take risks, you will surely fail. So it's our job to figure out how to balance um, and take advantage of the opportunities and minimize the negative parts of risk, all the while while taking informed risks. We have covered a lot of ground. Um, and I didn't have time for questions until now. So I'm going to. Um, have Liz monitor the chat and see if there's any questions that we want to spend a few minutes on before we wrap up at one at two o'clock. Leslie, I have a question. Um, we often hear the concept of um, an enterprise risk plan as if there should be one magic document where all of this is included in. Right. Maybe speak to that or speak to how an organization goes about doing that or whether whether it's something you should try and work towards? I have some mixed feelings on this, to be honest. Um, the terminology enterprise risk management, I think, first came out of the thinking that we had to have, we had to kind of look at it overall of the organization. Um, and I, I think the first risk management plan I ever wrote was 140 pages. And I, I, I'm thinking me and maybe one other person read it. So I wouldn't really recommend trying to pull everything together into, you know, 
to one document because I'm not sure that people will use it. I, I really have become a big believer in, you know, by team, by group. And I understand you have to have maybe a bigger framework for the organization and the board certainly needs some kind of framework to ensure that they're fulfilling their responsibilities. But, and there's some things that are across the organization, but the value of teams spending time having these conversations, I, I just can't overstate it enough. And that can be, you know, if there's certain responses or plans or training that need to get in place, I mean, I, that can be documented, but this stuff seems to be evolving so quickly now too. You know, what what worked or what the decision, I mean, during the COVID, as you well know, you know, the edict that came out on Tuesday was overturned on Friday, and then you had to create, come up with something else. And so it's evolving so quickly that I, I hate, and I'm not against documentation, but that's not the be all at all. Right. I think we have to prepare our staff differently. I think we have to have the conversations about, you know, scenarios and responding to things and and really training staff to think through instead of focusing on creating really extensive rule books. Um, it's like the playbook versus the rule book, right? Like the playbook that the um, quarterback goes onto the field and he's got, you know, 25 options to choose from, not one because he's trying to read what's going to happen and figure out what he's going to do, how he's going to respond to it. When we give him one, one way to respond, his chances of success are very poor. So I think we have to rethink how we approach it. I don't know if that's really answered your question, but I just recall working with organizations trying to create this extensive, huge document that, that, that I'm not sure really made a big difference in how people did business. Thanks, Leslie. I, I do agree. I, yeah, I, I agree with you that I, I don't think that it's, there's any value in trying to capture it all into one big document. Um, I was just curious as, as to what you thought of that. So I appreciate that. Well, I'm a terrible marketer because you know <laughs> people hire risk management consultants and pay them $40,000 to create these large documents. But yeah, yeah, that's not how I would spend my time. I certainly wouldn't encourage you to spend it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, we will be launching registration next week um, for our session on strategic risk. Um, when we and Leslie and I were in discussions on the next risk management topic, it was pretty clear that strategic risk is one of the most important areas of risk that um, many organizations should be focusing on right now. So that will be um, hosted in January, uh, but registration will open soon. And uh, in that session, Leslie, along with our CEO, Mike Grogan, um, will give all of you a much deeper look at those external trends, those theories, in risk management and do some scenario activities as well that will support you in making those high level organizational decisions. Um, so you can follow our newsletter um, to stay in touch with us or our LinkedIn even to hear about that training um, along with any other offerings that um, are on the horizon. So yeah. Um, we are a nonprofit ourselves, and we do know that every organization's needs can be pretty complex and specific, um, and the information out there is also equally complex. So um, in that case, you can contact our main email um, to chat to one of our experts with questions on anything regarding governance, strategy, legal compliance, financial stuff, um, and even if you're looking for an in-depth development project. Um, we are here and our mission is to support other folks achieve their missions. So thank you all. If Leslie uh, has thank any other so thoughts. Much, everybody. Yeah, I really yeah. appreciate your your time today. And hopefully we will see you again and stay safe out there, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>